Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Today we're going to be talking about starting a company in Singapore and the journey around it. My name is George Matthew and I'm from a company called Future Books. We are a bookkeeping and company secretarial firm. You're welcome to join us or follow us on Twitter and look up the videos that we put up on YouTube. Quite a few actually. So today, this evening, I'll first start with the legal structures that are available to first-time directors. And in this first slide, I'm focusing on locals. And locals here I define as those who are residing in Singapore with a citizenship or a permanent residence. As a local, you have the option of registering a sole proprietorship, which a good friend of mine has uh, likened to a MacBook Air because it has a very low cost of compliance and is quite cheap to register. Now, the flip side of that is that there is no liability protection on this type of legal entity. In fact, it is not a separate legal entity. It is only a name to do business as. A sole proprietorship does allow you to have an owner and a manager distinctively. And what we have noticed is that it's pretty effective if you want to try out an idea and are expecting annual revenue of below $100,000. The comparative that we have out there is the private limited company. Now that's a full-fledged legal entity where you are protected with limited liability and also have the ability to induct in distinct directors and shareholders. Now the flip side of a private limited company is that it does come with a high cost of compliance because it needs a distinct company secretary and regulatory filings to be complied with. And this sort of legal entity is pretty effective when you're expecting revenue to cross 100,000 per year and are also expecting perhaps to receive investment in in the form of new shareholders. Now, for a foreign director, legal structures that are available are restricted to a representative company, a branch company and a private limited. So a representative company is a light setup that's purely meant for market exploration purposes. It's something that International Enterprise Singapore approves. It is approved for a limited period of time, usually three to four years, and requires a parent company that's already established in a foreign country. And a representative company, do note, is not allowed to do business. You cannot enter into a trade contract. A private limited company we spoke about, and for a foreign director, it is the most logical practical option also because in a private limited company you do have the ability to apply for your work visa moving on these are some important government bodies that will play a picture during the life cycle of your company we have the accounting and corporate regulatory authority acra we have IRAS, which is the tax authority, and the Ministry of Manpower that governs work passes. Now, I spoke about the compliance requirements of a private limited company, and I can summarize these into four big requirements. All of these apply for a private limited company. The first is the requirement of having a local director. This must be somebody who is residing ordinarily in Singapore, is about 18 years old, and it can be somebody who's employed by another firm, whether that's a permanent resident, a citizen, or an employment pass holder. But it is best if they seek permission from their employer because contracts generally tend to have clauses which restrict the individual from standing as a director for another company. Now, another substitute that's open to you as a newly 
registering company is to ask for a nominee director. This is a professional who will stand in on your board of directors purely for compliance purposes. And it is one of the services that Future Books offers. Moving on, the registered mailing address is the second compliance requirement. This is normally a commercial address where you're going to conduct operations. It can be a condominium where you are available between 9 to 5 on Monday to Friday or an HDB. In the case of an HDB, you'll have to write in to um, HDB and seek special permission to use it as a home office. The third key requirement in terms of compliance is appointing a company secretary. This is something crucial because a good company secretary ensures that the entity that you've set up is legal. It has documentation that's thorough. And the key questions you might want to ask of your company secretary is, can they handle transactions like asset transfers? Can they handle share transfers, especially when foreign shareholders are involved? Can they file on time? Because there are annual filing requirements where the company secretary plays a very crucial role. Another um, aspect that I'm seeing increasingly important is in terms of can they handle digital documents? Because with shareholders all around the world, you're going to have a messy situation if paper documents are being couriered all through. Moving on, appointing an audit firm. Now, this is something that's required only for companies where there is a corporate entity as a shareholder or where the turnover exceeds five million. If you do not fall within these two categories of having a corporate shareholder or having turnover above 5 million per year, you do not need to appoint an audit firm. You are exempt from audit. If you do have to appoint an audit firm, we'd really recommend making this decision very carefully, meeting the auditor even before they are appointed if possible, or at least corresponding with them via email. What you want to know is, is the auditor responsive? Will they work to a budget that's suitable for your firm? So it need not necessarily be the auditor that quotes the cheapest fee, because we have seen companies where audits are stuck for a couple of years without exaggeration, just because there is very little response from the audit firm. And that's why we recommend choosing this carefully. Now, let's go into the actual details itself of incorporating a private limited company here. This is where you have a jigsaw in front of you. There are a lot of crucial decisions that you make while incorporating the company. And if you get it right the first time, it's going to save a lot of um, both effort and correction later on because you've planned out your entity right. Things that you might face are, do you appoint individuals as shareholders or corporates? What are the implications of either? If you are planning to take a remuneration out of the company, do you structure that as a salary, as a fee, or as a dividend? Another decision that you want to make is in terms of if you do need or require a corporate shareholder, is that going to be a 100% owner or are you going to have at least 10% shareholding by an individual? I mentioned 10% because there are significant tax benefits that are available to a startup which has a minimum of 10% individual shareholding. Moving on. So, Pay attention to these slides because right at the end of my presentation, which is going to be pretty short, I'm going to ask a question from within my presentation. Answer it right first and you get a $500 talk time to plan out your incorporation or immigration with one of our consultants.
that's coming up. Now, completing the incorporation itself. The key things that you will decide on during that time is choosing your company's name. And here there are certain terms that are restricted. Um, terms like bank are restricted. Terms like financial will immediately get the application referred to the uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore and result in a long delay. So one of the first things that we as a professional incorporation firm do is do a name check on ACRA and then reserve the name so that when you're ready for your incorporation, your name's available for you. The next decision is around your registered mailing address. And here the key thing to remember is that this is the address where all government communication will come to you. So you want this to be a mailing address where you can receive both regular and registered mail which requires signature. So somebody should be available to receive mail between 9 to 5, Monday to Friday. What is an SSIC code? SSIC stands for the Singapore Standard Industrial Classification and this is essentially the activity of your company. You have the ability of setting up to two activities for your company. These in best practice should be related activities and you do have the ability to choose from a long list of activities that are given on the ACTRA website and also making a description that is absolutely appropriate for your business. So the activity code itself is something you select from the pre-selected list on ACRA, while the description is something that you can enter to represent your business to the world. And I'll explain in a little bit why I say represent your business to the world. The other decisions you'll have to make is in terms of the directors you appoint to the board. It's really important that these directors are the representatives of the shareholders. The shareholders want to make sure that they are represented adequately on the board. So even if you do choose to um, have a nominee director or have a known associate stand in as your local director, always maintain the majority on the board of directors. Have a minimum of two directors from your end while the nominee or the local associate who's standing in for you can be the third director. That's important because directors yield a lot of power within a company. Now, with the shareholders, we spoke about uh, individual versus corporate. And the other key decisions are around paid up capital and shares. This is also pretty interesting and important for startups because the paid up capital is the actual amount of cash that the shareholders are going to inject into the company's bank account within the first 30 days of incorporation. While the shares are something that can be quite large in structure. What do I mean by that? A very good structure for a startup is to have, as an example, $10,000 in paid up capital because that's around the amount that a bank will require you to have an opening balance. But for your shares, your number of shares could be up to 1 million or above. The reason is because your per value of share is what you decide and you want to have a high level of shares issued so that tomorrow when there's another investor or shareholder coming in, your shares are easily divisible. And this is the kind of thing that a company secretary will advise you in depth. So that's the last requirement that you will have to go through while incorporating a company is appointing a company secretary who has the due knowledge to advise and fulfill processes. The reason why I said what you describe on your SSIC code represents your business to the world is because this document, the BIS file or the business profile for full, is something that's available to 
literally the whole world to purchase on Acra, which gives a description of your business in terms of who the directors are, who the shareholders are, and what the business activity is. And that's public information. Your financial information is public only if you are subject to audit and file something called XBRL. But these basic information of your profile, this is available to anybody in the world. The cost is $5.50. The other key document that you will be um, looking at while going through an incorporation is the Memorandum and Articles of Association, or MNAA for short. And with a good company secretary, you can expect that they will run a draft of the Memorandum and Articles of Association past you. Because this Articles of Association are the constitution of your company. There are approximately 100 articles, and this is one of the very fascinating documents to go through even before your incorporation to understand where powers reside, how you can change them, and you can go into a lot of details to amend these and protect your rights both as a director and as a shareholder in the company. Let me give an example of the kind of rights you will find in your Articles of Association. It's called preemption rights, and what it means is that if there are a group of shareholders who come together and incorporate the company, if one of them decides to exit, that individual or company will first have to offer shares to the rest of the current shareholders before they can offer it to a third party. Now, that's something pretty useful. If you are a couple of startup founders and one of you decides to leave, you want to make sure that the rest of you as co-founders have the ability to take over the ownership first before this is offered to a third party. So that's preemption rights and that's one of the things you can incorporate into an Articles of Association. Now, another document that you will receive as a part of your um, incorporation process, this is after, is your share certificate. This is a physical document that proves your ownership of the company. It is issued by the company secretary and a common seal is affixed on this. This is an important legal document and something that should be in your custody as a shareholder once the company is incorporated. Another document that you'll see right after incorporation is what's called the first director's first Board of Directors Resolution. This is where the directors resolve on things like who formed the first quorum of directors? Is a bank account being opened? If so, who are the authorized signatories? And uh, this is a document that most banks will ask you for even before you can open a corporate account up. Let me explain uh, these two terms, the difference between a company stamp and a company seal or what's called a common seal. A company stamp is a little rubber um, stamp that you can uh, get made uh, which uh, has your company's full name and the UEN which is the unique entity number and you can also choose to include other details like your registered address. This rubber stamp is what you would affix pretty commonly on um, anything from an invoice to a contract to a acknowledgement for a career. There is another contraption which is a slightly larger metallic tool. There you go, I'm holding up one of these right now. And this is called the common seal or the company seal. This is a very privileged instrument that needs to be within the custody of the company secretary and is affixed only on the most important transactions of the company. The reason is because this metallic common seal is the signature of the company. Before it is used, there needs to be a resolution authorizing its use every single time by the directors of the company. So that's the difference between a rubber stamp and a common seal. 
Another difference here is that a rubber stamp you can have multiple copies of, while with a common seal there should be only one copy, and if that is for any reason lost or needs to be replaced, even that needs to be minuted within the company's secretarial file. You do have an iPhone app, that's something you're uh, free to look at. Opening a corporate bank account. This is the reason why a number of uh, people choose to even start up the company because this is sort of the trigger. Before you can open a corporate bank account, you do need to get your entity registered. And in our blog, we publish an article where we very extensively look at banks within Singapore that are startup friendly. And on final analysis, we shortlisted two banks, DBS and OCBC, for the fact that they are startup friendly and welcome startup nature of transactions, which means that they are comfortable with having the first six months at minimal transaction and then building up. Another thing that I'd like to point out here is that um, in terms of internet banking, um, I have observed distinctly that DBS does have the best interface, both in terms of speed of setup and actual operational use. Well, getting used to corporate banking in Singapore. While starting up the account, what you will need is two officers of the company which can be either two directors or a director and a company secretary physically present to open an account. And the other decision you'll need to make is in terms of who are the signatories. And here the bank will ask you to further differentiate who are the authorized signatories and who are the transaction signatories. The authorized signatories are usually the directors of the company and they are the only ones authorized to A, open the account, B, close the account, and C, added transaction level signatories. Now, transaction level signatories are people who sign checks, hold internet banking tokens, and act on a day-to-day -day basis. And these need not necessarily be a director. So an employee of your startup can act as a transaction level signatory. Another thing that I highly recommend um, is done while opening the account is setting transaction limits where for a certain threshold of transaction you can allow single signatory but beyond a certain threshold a point two or three signatory requirements so that your account is protected from fraudulent transactions. Uh, the difference between the minimum to open the account and the minimum daily balance is um, one is what you need to get it started initially. So that's $500 with DBS for a company with all individuals and with OCBC that's $3,000. While the minimum average daily balance is what you'd need to maintain within the company bank account after the first six months. So both these banks waive off that requirement for the first six months. Um, I'm really happy to report that internet banking in Singapore is getting better, distinctively better. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, DBS is sort of leading the pack. The OCBC is fast catching up. Um, one difference you'll notice between say Singapore and Europe is that checks are still quite prevalent in Singapore so that's probably going to be a part of your startup's day-to-day -day, um, life especially when playing suppliers who insist on receiving checks. Um, I'm going to move on to startup friendly visas and uh, these are obviously uh, mainly relevant to foreigners who wish to um, start up a company. You have a number of options. Um, one of the easiest is called a letter of consent. This is where you're holding a dependent pass and then need to apply for a letter of consent with the Ministry of Manpower and that allows you to run your company 
as a local director and be employed within the company. The process for a letter of consent is um, quiet, relaxed, compared to the other passes which I'm going to be speaking of now. But the key condition is that you already need to be holding a dependent pass. The other visa which is easier comparatively is what's called a business visa. This is sort of an entry visa which allows you to hold business meetings, but it does not allow you to act as local director or to be employed actively within the company within Singapore. The two passes which have recently got considerably more difficult are the employment pass and the entre pass. Entre pass stands for entrepreneur pass. Both of these options are available to startup founders and the key difference is that for an entrepreneur pass it comes with the condition that the business employ a minimum of two locals within the first year and that then uh, increases as each year's renewal is processed and also that there is a minimum business spending which currently is set at a hundred thousand dollars excluding your remuneration as the director so the entrepass comes with those two conditions of requiring a minimum of two locals for the first year in employment and a hundred thousand in local business spending excluding your director's remuneration with an employment pass um, these restrictions are not put in place an employment pass is meant for those who are holding a professional degree a university degree is usually um, university degree or higher is something that's usually considered favorably and also where um, the nature of business is um, such that um, revenue can be clearly defined where so you can show um, prospective customers and contracts or letters of intent in place so both of these are routes that are available for startup founders um, and uh, it's worth looking at these very carefully before selecting one because switching between one to the other can be quite a nightmarish process. Now, let's look at the summary of important timings. We first um, go through the activity of incorporation and tentatively I've put in 10 days as um, an expected time frame for incorporation that includes um, planning through your incorporation carefully collecting the documents required and then a few days to process it though technically this can be done in a single day because the incorporation process itself is online and uh, we at future books have an online incorporation form which sort of streamlines the process